Welcome to this module, which is dedicated to the theology of the Eucharistic prayers, and uh, mostly I'm focusing on Eucharistic prayer one in this module. Now, in the reading assignments, there will be a lot more historical and theological detail, rich historical and theologic, theological detail with respect to the Mass. So, continuing with my uh, standard operating procedure, what I want to do in this module is focus on one uh, aspect, one related element in liturgical theology, and then leave the reading assignments to fill in a lot of the other gaps and provide a lot more historical and theological detail. So we are reading uh, in terms of the theology of the Mass, and so in this module I want to look at just the theology of the Eucharistic prayers, and not all of them, but with a real focus to Eucharistic prayer one. For 1500 years, all we had in the Western Church was Eucharistic Prayer 1. Before Vatican II, it was just Eucharistic Prayer 1. Every day, weekday Mass, solemnities, Sundays, Christmas, feast days, funerals. Eucharistic Prayer 1 was the only Eucharistic prayer that we had. Vatican II greatly expanded uh, the Eucharistic prayers and developed and created additional Eucharistic prayers. So we have we're very familiar with Eucharistic Prayer 2 and 3 in particular. Perhaps we've heard Eucharistic Prayer 4 on occasion. There are many others. And depending on your parish and the preference of your pastor, you, have met, you may have heard other Eucharistic prayers used at, at the liturgy. For 1,500 years, it was Eucharistic Prayer 1 in Latin. Now, I keep saying 1,500 years when we know the church is older than 1,500 years. Uh, why am I saying this? Well, uh, for the first three to four centuries, there weren't Eucharistic prayers, not like we have today. There's a reference uh, to uh, the consecration where it says the presider gives thanks as best he can. So uh, the Eucharistic prayers are something that were written and developed and enhanced over the centuries, but the first two to three centuries, we don't have any reference to any Eucharistic prayer, especially when used in the West. Now, this makes sense. Remember, in the earliest centuries, Christianity was uh, a sometimes, oftentimes, persecuted faith. There were no big, magnificent church buildings. In the first several centuries, people met for liturgy in each other's homes. The presider would have, uh, it would have been a much more uh, intimate perhaps, but also less formalized and less ritualized experience of the liturgy. Now we have the words of institution from the New Testament from Jesus himself, so most likely those were used. And so it would have been up to the various presiders to, to pray publicly with the small group of Christians assembled in someone's home and the Eucharist was celebrated that way. One of the earliest Eucharistic prayers on record is that of Hippolytus from the third century. Hippolytus wrote down a Eucharistic prayer and when Vatican II decided to add to the Eucharistic prayers, they used the Eucharistic prayer of Hippolytus to use or to, as a guide to create Eucharistic prayer two. So our Eucharistic prayer two that we usually hear at weekday masses because it's more compact, it's shorter. Eucharistic Prayer 2 comes from the pen of Hippolytus. Now, Hippolytus was an interesting guy. Uh, there was a time when he was uh, in, in conflict with the church. He is the first anti-pope who's really the only anti-pope who's ever been canonized. So he had his run-in with uh, <laughs> the church in Rome. He's reconciled to it before the end, and he's canonized too uh, after all of that. From Hippolytus, we have Eucharistic Prayer 2. I'm going to put a link here. So if you want to see the Eucharistic Prayer of Hippolytus and how it has shaped our current Eucharistic Prayer 2, you can pause me now if you like and open up that link and read uh, this and note the comparison, or you can do it at a later time and we'll just keep going. So it's really the fourth century when you know, Christianity is legalized, the fathers of the church begin writing Eucharistic prayer, writing Eucharistic prayers, I should say. Now there is a need for public liturgical worship, and so the Eucharistic prayers in particular are written in the fourth century, again, Hippolytus in the third, uh, but it's uh, 
Basil. It's John Chrysostom in the East. It's St. Ambrose in the West. The Church Fathers are writing the Eucharistic prayers that have been treasured ever since. And it's St. Ambrose who gives us Eucharistic Prayer 1. And it is from the pen of St. Ambrose that we owe the, uh, the essence of Eucharistic Prayer 1 that served the Church ever since the days of Ambrose for some 1,500 years later. Ambrose, as we all know, is the Bishop of Milan. And it's interesting, uh, just as a side note, uh, did you know that there are millions of Catholics who are not Roman in the Western Church now? Now, we've all heard of the Eastern Rite Catholics, the Byzantine Catholics, the Marianite Catholics, and we think, oh, well, that's part of the Eastern uh, churches that came back to Rome, true. But even in the West, there are Catholics who are not Roman in the Western Church. Up in the city of Milan, there are some five million Catholics, every bit as Catholic as you and I, but they are not Roman. They are Ambrosian Rite Catholics. And again, Ambrose, the colossal Archbishop of Milan, uh, who writes Eucharistic Prayer One, also creates a, an entire liturgy that's somewhat different than what we're used to as Roman Catholics. Up in Milan, if you go to Mass in Milan, you'll see a liturgy that's a little different. Now, it's just as Catholic, it's just as valid as the Roman rites, but the Ambrosian rites are a little different. Here are some of the key differences in the Ambrosian liturgy than uh, when compared to the Roman liturgy. Uh, the prayers of the faithful come after the homily. The creed comes after the offertory. And the sign of peace comes after the creed and before the offertory. And this is actually where Pope Benedict was hoping to move the sign of peace. He did not get around to it and he realizes anytime we change things it's a, it's a major disruption and he wants it to be more of an organic development. But I, you know, I think it's fair to say that where the sign of peace is now it can be rather disruptive. The Eucharist has been consecrated. The Lord is present on the, on the altar in the Eucharistic species, and then we go around and we're shaking hands and we're, you know, giving the sign of peace. And again, I don't want to um, have you be inhibited at Mass when you, after, you, after you hear me say this, but there could be a better location in the liturgy for the sign of peace. How about before the consecration? Uh, this is where it is in the Ambrosian rite. The sign of peace comes after the creed and before the offertory, which is exactly where Pope Benedict hoped to move it. He did a consultation with all the bishops of the world. Bishop Jekylls was in Wichita at the time. He asked all the priests what we thought of it. We thought it was a great idea. Uh, all the uh, results were communicated back to Rome, but obviously Pope Benedict didn't uh, make that move. This was the time when they were changing all of the translations into the new English translations. And so uh, they had enough on their plates in Rome, liturgically speaking, so this change didn't happen. But I wouldn't be surprised if we see it, uh, perhaps in our lifetime. It doesn't seem to be uh, an overriding concern of Pope Francis, but subsequent popes could take this up because Pope Benedict uh, wrote about this quite extensively, hoping that the sign of peace, which again, is new in terms of uh, Vatican II. Uh, it's a new uh, embellishment to the liturgy. Pope Benedict was hoping to move it to where the Ambrosian Rite has it, as I've already specified before the consecration. Uh, there's no Lamb of God at Mass in the Ambrosian Rite. Advent is six weeks long, not four. So their ad Advent season is a longer season than our four weeks of Advent. Uh, Lent starts four days later for the Ambrosian Catholics, so they don't have an Ash Wednesday, and they don't have a Fat Tuesday. Instead, they have a Fat Saturday. So it's the Saturday before the Sunday that starts Lent uh, in the Ambrosian calendar. And their chant is very different. Ambrosian chant is different from Gregorian chant. Now, we don't utilize uh, Gregorian chant much in our parishes now, uh, sadly, in my opinion. But the Ambrosian chant is very different. It's much more primal. It's much more plaintive. 
Gregorian chant can get quite mellifluous with lots of movement and lots of this, it's called melismatic uh, movement, you know, just lots of, uh, uh, a lot of notes, as uh, the emperor said in response to Mozart. Ambrosian chant is different, very plaintive, very primal, just very stark. I want to uh, embed a little video clip here of Ambrosian chant to let you just have a, a taste of it. And after you listen to this, then I will uh, continue. But let's just listen to just a bit of Ambrosian chant now to get a catch a flavor of the Ambrosian liturgy celebrated up in Northern Italy to this day. Let's look at what makes up a standard Eucharistic prayer. There are some uh, elements that are common to all of them, and when I say all of them, I mean there are dozens of different Eucharistic prayers. East and West, throughout all of the different uh, rites of the Church, there are different anaphoras, there are different Eucharistic prayers. And so, in the West, Eucharistic Prayer 1 comes from the pen of Ambrose, but John Chrysostom wrote a Eucharistic prayer, or I should say an anaphora, same thing. Uh, lots of different church fathers start to write different anaphorae, to use the plural, and they have different Eucharistic prayers traced back to different church fathers that become canonized or standardized in the different uh, liturgical uh, rites of the church, both East and West. The standard elements here are uh, what I want to present, and they are mostly, but not always, the same. They can be assembled in different, uh, different order. Uh, we'll see a, a little bit more uh, as we go throughout this module. But let me just give you the standard elements that are in most, but not every, Eucharistic prayer, most, but not every, anaphora. So after the Sanctus, the Holy, 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 there is what's called the Post Sanctus, a short prayer that is uh, the bridge between the Sanctus and then the words of institution which come next, usually. So we have the Sanctus, the post-Sanctus prayer, which is sort of a bridge prayer up to the words of institution, which of course come from the New Testament, from the words of Jesus. There is what is uh, known as the anamnesis, the remembering of the great deeds of the Paschal mystery. It's a statement in which the church remembers all of the elements that were a part of the passion, the resurrection, and the ascension of Christ. Then there's the oblation, which is an offering to the Lord of the sacrifice of the Eucharistic bread and wine and of the prayers and uh, thanksgiving of the faithful. There is also uh, the element known as the epiclesis, which is the invocation or the calling down of the Holy Spirit upon the gifts of bread and wine, helping to turn them into the body and blood of Christ. Then there are intercessions. In this prayer, sometimes long, it's sometimes shorter, depending on the Eucharistic prayer, in which uh, different needs will be mentioned, prayers for the living, prayers for the dead, 
uh, prayers for um, uh, the saints and for their invocation upon us. The list of the names that are commemorated in the different Eucharistic prayers vary. Uh, we always list the Pope in the Western Church. Actually, any church that's in union with Rome lists the Pope. Otherwise, of course, they're not praying for the Bishop of Rome. But the list of names then uh, is an important indicator of uh, the, the uh, background of the Eucharistic prayer or the anaphora that's being considered. And then finally, a doxology, a solemn hymn of praise to the Trinity. Now, these are the main elements in any Eucharistic prayer, but they can be in different orders. If you look at, in a different order, I should say, if you look at Eucharistic prayer one, which was the Roman canon, and you compare that to an anaphora coming from the Eastern church, you'll see that they're in a different order often. The intercessions are, can be in a different order. The epiclesis may be in a different order. And so, although these are the standard elements in any Eucharistic prayer, Different churches have placed them in a different order. And uh, it, it, again, it gives a lot of um, indication about the theology of the respective uh, Eucharistic prayer, just to look at the order and what's happening. I'll point out a couple of things as we go through this module, but just ho hold on to these basic building blocks that are part of any Eucharistic prayer. I'm going to spend a fair amount of time now explaining why was Eucharistic Prayer 1 called the Roman Canon if it's written by Ambrose up in Milan in northern Italy, why is it called the Roman Canon? Well, first of all, what does canon mean? Canon just means rule or standard. So Eucharistic Prayer 1 was the standard way that the Roman Church prayed, written by Bishop Ambrose, of course, up north, but still this was the way the Roman Church prayed using the Roman canon. Still, why is it called the Roman canon? Especially if it's written by a guy up in northern Italy, St. Ambrose. Well, let's look at some of the names that are enshrined in the Roman canon. Let's look at, uh, this is a really important indicator. Uh, Eucharistic prayer one, it says, in union with the whole church, we honor Mary, the ever virgin mother of Jesus Christ, our Lord and God. We honor Joseph, her husband. Uh, just as just as a side note, it was Pope John the Twenty-Third who added the name Joseph here. Remember, John the Twenty-Third is the one who called Vatican II. It was only in the 1960s that Joseph, Saint Joseph, that his name was added to uh, the Eucharistic Prayer One. But given the the devotion that we had to Joseph, this is hardly a controversial move. But it's very late. It's only last century that Joseph was added to uh, that the name of Joseph was added to Eucharistic Prayer One by Pope John the Twenty-Third. Then we have all the apostles, Peter and Paul, Andrew, James, and John. And we go through the rest of these. Notice the names who come after Simon and Jude. We honor Linus, Cletus, Clement, Sixtus. Who were these men? Well, these were the very next bishops of Rome right after St. Peter. Linus is the bishop right after St. Peter. He's the second bishop of Rome. And according to tradition, St. Paul ordained Linus to be uh, a presbyter and we have a mention of a Linus in 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 4. Now is this the same Linus who is the second bishop of Rome? We can't prove it but according to tradition uh, this is uh, uh, where we get our second pope Linus who was ordained by St. Paul. Linus, Cletus, sometimes he's called Anacletus, it's the same man Cletus, his, he's the third bishop of Rome. Uh, one of the things that Cletus does is he organizes all of Rome into 24 different house churches. They're called tituli in the Latin, house churches, basically parishes. It is Cletus who sets up the oldest Christian sites in Rome. We'll see many of them if you go with me to Rome. And I'll talk about a few more of them throughout the rest of this module, but it's Cletus who designates these different house churches. Where can Christians go and celebrate the liturgy? In a house church in Rome, designated by Pope Cletus. So these are centers of Christian activity in ancient pagan Rome. They would have been completely uh, ordinary. They would not have stood out. They would not have been magnificent churches. They would have just been homes or houses designated by Pope Cletus 
as the place of Christian worship for the liturgy, but also Christian activity. So the poor would have been served out of these various house churches. Uh, it would have been a place of Christian gathering as well. These uh, various tituli that were set up by the third bishop of Rome, Pope Cletus. Then we have Pope Clement. Pope Clement is a fascinating uh, man. Uh, he wrote a letter of Clement to the church in Corinth. So Pope Clement writes to the Corinthians and what's going on in Corinth? Well, it's going to be really hard for you to believe this, but the priests in Corinth were bickering with each other. They were fighting and there was, this, uh, there was division in the church among the various priests serving in the church in Corinth. So Pope Clement in Rome writes to the Corinthians uh, the letter of Clement, and a lot of people wanted to put it in the Bible. A lot of the early churches revered it as uh, a letter just like the letters that we have from St. Paul. We know that the letter of Clement did not make it into the canon of the New Testament. We call only the apostolic letters uh, make it in, but here we have evidence of a bishop in Rome writing to a different diocese to help sort out a problem there. It's an important indication of uh, papal authority. Remember, Corinth had its own bishop. Why isn't the Bishop of Corinth settling this? We don't know, but Clement in Rome is writing to the Corinthians to help sort things out. So here we have the Bishop of Rome intervening very early on, third Bishop of Rome, to try to settle a problem in another diocese and to try to bring peace and uh, Christian unity to, well, in this case, to Corinth. Next, we have Cornelius and Cyprian. Who were these two? Well, Cornelius was a later bishop of Rome. Oh, I skipped over Sixtus, sorry. Sixtus, as his name suggests, was the sixth bishop of Rome. We don't know much about uh, this first Pope Sixtus. There were several other popes who took that name after him, but he is the sixth bishop of Rome, as his name suggests. Okay, now we're ready for Cornelius and Cyprian. We fast forward to the third century now, and there is a big problem uh, in the Church of Rome. Uh, what's happened is there's been a persecution, and people have fallen away from the faith, and after the persecution ended, they want to come back to becoming uh, practicing Christians again, and a man by the name of Novatian objected. Novatian was a priest in Rome, and very hardcore, he was not going to allow those who had lapsed to come back. So there's a novation schism in the Church of Rome, and we've seen the Donatists in Northern Africa. That happens uh, for much the same reasons in Northern Africa. An earlier version of this is the novation schism, where people have fallen away from the faith during times of persecution. They want to come back. Novation says no. He sets himself up as an anti-pope, and so he is in open conflict with Pope Cornelius. Pope Cornelius is trying to be like Pope Francis today, figure of reconciliation. He's being fought by novation. Uh, but Cyprian in Northern Africa rallies the clergy there to support Pope Cornelius against the anti-Pope novation. Again, trying to bring people, welcome people back into the fold after they've admittedly fallen away. Another wave of persecution comes and both Pope Cornelius and Cyprian are exiled. Cornelius from Rome, Cyprian from Northern Africa. According to Jerome, they end up in the same concentration camp and they die uh, in exile, both of them. Uh, and so the churches put their names right next to each other in the Eucharistic Prayer 1, in the, in the anaphora from St. Ambrose. Their names are right next to each other as a remembrance of how closely they worked with each other to try to bring unity uh, to the early church. Next we have Lawrence and Chrysogonus. Lawrence we probably have heard of. Lawrence was a deacon in the early church, third century, time of persecution. Uh, he is ordained a deacon by Pope Sixtus in the year 257 AD. And uh, Again, usually he's depicted with the palm of the martyrs. Usually he's depicted with a grill because we know how Lawrence was, uh, was martyred, according to the uh, story, which you probably all heard. You know, He is grilled to death, and Lawrence supposedly says to his executioners, turn me over, I'm done on this side. You have to be Catholic, I think, to really appreciate that kind of 
humor, but it shows a, a lighthearted, I don't care what happens to me because of my faith in Christ. So I think it's, again, uh, something that Catholic sensibilities can appreciate probably better than other uh, Christians. But anyway, that's not my favorite story of St. Lawrence. Here's my favorite story. St. Lawrence is a deacon in the early church. As such, he's charged with uh, maintaining the finances in the Church of Rome. He's in charge of the distribution of food to the poor in the church in Rome. And so during a time of persecution, Lawrence is arrested and the Roman pagans demand of him, hand over the treasure of the church. Lawrence takes him outside, opens his arms and says to them, here is the treasure of the church. And he's pointing to all the poor Christians in Rome. And the Romans have loved Lawrence ever since then. They've never forgotten him. He has two churches, not just one, dedicated to his honor, St. Lawrence extremely uh, important saint to the Roman church. Uh, next we have Chrysogonus. He, we don't know too much about him. Tradition tells us that he was a Roman soldier who converts to Christianity and is martyred for it after uh, he is found out. There's also, uh, we have some letters that he wrote to a woman named Anastasia that we'll see later. And in these letters, he is encouraging Anastasia to hold fast to her faith. She too will later be martyred uh, it's a, a beautiful testimony to the faith of Chrysogonus that he's writing these letters of encouragement to this young Christian girl, Anastasia, to stay strong in Christ during times of persecution in Rome. Maybe you can start to see why this is called the Roman Canon Eucharistic Prayer One because of all of these martyrs that give their life for Christ in the city of Rome. We have two more of them, John and Paul. Who were John and Paul? Like Chrysogonus, John and Paul were Roman soldiers. They were brothers. Uh, they convert to Christianity. Uh, they are found out. And once they're discovered, they are given the privilege of a private execution at their home. Again, because they were respected Roman soldiers, they didn't have to go through the shameful public execution that, uh, say, crucifixion would be. They were given the privilege of a private execution at home. It happens in their home. Uh, the years go by, Christianity is legalized a few decades later in 313, and once that happens, the church, the people then never forgot their example, the example of John and Paul. And so they build a church, the church of John and Paul, over the house where this happened. And you can go visit this site in Rome. The church of John and Paul sits over the house of John and Paul. If you go inside the church, and then off to the side, there'll be a little Franciscan priest standing. He'll take you downstairs to the basement, and you can see the place where John and Paul were executed because of their faith in Jesus Christ. If you notice the interior of this church, all those chandeliers, they're not original, obviously. They don't, I guess they fit in a way. It's a very Baroque church on the inside, but these chandeliers, uh, Archbishop Spellman from New York was given all of these chandeliers. A friend of his was renovating the Waldorf Historia Hotel in New York City, the famous hotel. He didn't know what to do with all his old chandeliers, so he gave them to Archbishop Spellman, who then uh, gave them to the Church of John and Paul in Rome. And that's where those chandeliers come from that are hanging in there to this day. Cosmas and Damien and all the saints. Cosmas and Damien were physicians. They were not working in the city of Rome. They were working in the Eastern Church, present-day Turkey. They were physicians who cared for the poor, gave medical service to the poor without charging them. They were revered uh, for, for doing so. They lived their faith as Christians. They were educated men, obviously, as physicians, but they cared for the poor, and they, uh, again, took care of them as, as doctors uh, without charging, and again, they were much beloved. Uh, they didn't work in Rome, but their relics were transferred to Rome centuries later during a time of persecution in the Eastern Church. And so the Church of Cosmos and Damien is in Rome. Their relics are there to this day. You can visit the Church of Cosmos and Damien if you go with me to Rome. Uh, here's a mosaic of the inside of the Church of Cosmos and Damien. I show it to you because this mosaic was so important to Thomas Merton, the famous American convert. Merton is walking through Rome, even before his conversion, and he notices all of the Christian mosaics and the purity 
that comes through these mosaics. A lot of pagan Roman sculpture is semi-pornographic and just is very off-putting to Thomas Merton, but he sits in these churches, Cosmos and Damien being one of them, and he looks at these ancient Christian mosaics and the purity and the faith that just uh, spoke to him, led him to Christ. Um, it was through these mosaics that he has a sense of uh, what it was like to live the faith in early Christianity and to turn from all of the, the distractions and even the, 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 the degradations of culture and to see where real purity and strength could be found. The ancient Romans hated the purity of the early Christians, and they tried to mock it, and we'll see this a little bit later in some of the other martyrs that we, that we, uh, that I talked to you about. Okay, then later on, there's another list of names for ourselves too. We ask some share in the fellowship of your apostles and martyrs with Ignatius, Alexander, Marcellinus, Peter. Ignatius, this is Saint Ignatius of Antioch. The second bishop of Antioch, St. Peter, was the first bishop of Antioch. Recall Peter goes to Antioch before he ends up in Rome, so Antioch claims St. Peter as its first bishop, as does the city of Rome where he meets his execution. The second bishop of Antioch was St. Ignatius. He too will be arrested and he too will meet his martyrdom in Rome and he writes these powerful letters as he is making his way to his death in the city of Rome as a martyr. And again, uh, Ignatius, the first person to use the term the Catholic Church. We see this in the writings of Ignatius of Antioch. Probably around the year 107, this happens. The letters of Ignatius can be dated to around 11, I'm sorry, to about 107. Notice, this is about the time of the latest writings of the New Testament. And so uh, Ignatius is writing his letters at the time that, that uh, the letters of Peter and some of the later uh, writings of the New Testament are being written. Coterminous with the New Testament is the term Catholic Church that uh, is, appears in the writings of Ignatius of Antioch. Pope Alexander, we don't know too much about him. He was a martyr during the Diocletian persecution around the year 303, so a century uh, two centuries actually after uh, St. Ignatius of Antioch. Marcellinus works closely with Peter, who is not St. Peter, but this Peter is a Roman exorcist. And so uh, these two are paired together. There is a church in Rome that is dedicated to Marcellinus and Peter. Marcellinus was a pope and Peter was an exorcist, again, during a time of uh, persecution in the second century. Don't know too much about them, but uh, again, in the RCIA, where exorcisms are an important component of the process of Christian initiation, don't think of it as the, as the movie, you know, The Exorcist. Again, the time of Marcellinus and Peter is still a basically pagan culture, and so the role of Christian exorcist was an important witness against the degradations of the culture of that time, something that we may see return to popularity in our own time as our culture continues to degrade. Now, unless you think it's all men, we see Felicity, Perpetua, Agnes, Agatha, Lucy, Agnes, all the virgin martyrs here. Well, not all of them. Uh, we see Felicity and Perpetua. Perpetua was a noble woman, a married woman. She has a child. And Felicity was her slave. They are captured. They are found out to be Christians. And so they are approaching martyrdom. I'm going to put a link to the diary of the martyrdom of St. Perpetua here. It's a beautiful testimony. Uh, you can read the accounts of her final days as she is uh, awaiting her execution. Uh, her father comes to her and begs Perpetua to renounce her faith so that she doesn't bring shame upon the family. Uh, she has a daughter. She begs that the infant is allowed to stay with her in her cell before she meets her final end. It's just so concrete and real and moving, the accounts, the account of uh, Perpetua's martyrdom. Uh, that's not very long, and I would encourage you to read it, and you can pause me now and read it if you like, or, or keep going. Uh, Agatha, Lucy, Agnes, uh, the situations are a little different for all three of these women, but basically, to use a very contemporary term, they're all uh, victims of sexual harassment. 
All of them are approached by Roman pagan soldiers. All of them refuse to, to compromise their virtue or to compromise their faith in Christ. They are all executed for it. Uh, you know, the Romans, again, hated Christian purity, and they didn't believe people could actually live like that. They were pretty debauched, frankly, the, the Romans at this time, and the pagans especially. Uh, they just don't believe the Christians can live like this. They just, they mock it for that reason. These women, almost, I think all three of them, were sent to brothels before they are executed. The Romans are trying to break them. They're trying to prove that, see, nobody can really do this. This is all a charade. These women aren't really that virtuous. They try to break them of their vir virtue. They all fail. And then, as a result, all three of these uh, early Christian martyrs are killed because of their faith in Christ. Cecilia, Anastasia, and all the saints. Oh, Cecilia is a wonderful a uh, wonderful story of um, her martyrdom. Cecilia becomes a Christian. Uh, she converts her husband as well. He becomes a Christian because of her good example. They are both found out. Uh, her husband is executed first, but then they come for Cecilia, and they uh, try to execute her. And we know a lot about her execution because of something that happened in 1556 long time later, 1556, the tomb of Cecilia is discovered. A man by the name of Carlo Maderno is the most famous sculptor in, sculptor in Rome after Michelangelo. Anyway, he's in Rome, Carlo Maderno, the tomb of Saint Cecilia. They've known where it is because the church was built over the ruins, but they're doing some work underneath uh, the basement of the church and they open her tomb inadvertently, and they are able to peer in and see the remains of St. Cecilia, and it causes quite a stir in Rome that the, the remains of Cecilia have been unearthed, and people are flocking out to see them, and we know the way in which Cecilia died because her skeletal remains were uh, preserved. And I'm going to have to do it this way because... I'm forced to record this as a camera. She dies like this, with her hands positioned like this. Three persons in one God. Cecilia dies witnessing her faith, encouraging Christians to stay true to the one true God. Carlo Maderno sees the skeleton of St. Cecilia, and he sculpts what I think is the most beautiful statue in Rome. And it's under the high altar in the church of St. Cecilia in you can see this too if, if you go to Rome with me. Here's the statue. Notice Cecilia on her side, blindfolded. But notice the position of her hands. She's witnessing to her faith in Christ. But also on the side of her neck, three wounds, three gashes. They didn't uh, kill her cleanly. There are three marks on her neck. It took three tries. It takes several days for Cecilia to die. But... She stays strong throughout the whole procedure, the whole ordeal, exhorting her fellow Christians to stay true to the faith. She's a magnificent woman, so strong in her faith, St. Cecilia. And uh, again, you can see the statue uh, for yourself. It's magnificent. Okay, those are the main names in Eucharistic Prayer 1. They say a lot about uh, the theology of Eucharistic Prayer 1. They tell us a lot about... Uh, the style of Eucharistic prayer one. This is the Roman canon. We see now why, because so many of these saints give their lives in Rome. If you look at other Eucharistic prayers, other anaphora, and other uh, Eastern churches, they'll have different names. Again, because uh, they are remembering different heroes in the list of the saints' name. But not only that, there are also uh, the main elements, the main building blocks do differ. If you look at Eucharistic Prayer 1, for the longest time there was really not much of an epiclesis. The role of the Holy Spirit was, uh, well the Eastern Church says it was neglected in the West. The epiclesis was pretty weak. The epiclesis used to be just bless and approve our offering, make it acceptable to you, an offering in spirit and truth. That's not really an invocation. That's not really calling down the Holy Spirit. Uh, it's been improved in the new translations. 
where it's much more explicit, where the priest asks, let your spirit come down upon these gifts. So the epiclesis has been strengthened in the Western Church, and the East will say it's a much needed improvement. The epiclesis in the West used to be uh, really uh, downplayed. Again, think about it. In the Western Church, Jesus is front and center, and the, the, really the heart of our devotion seems to be very Christocentric. Of course, the role of the Father is not ignored, but the Holy Spirit, uh, outside of charismatic churches, I mean, how, how, how important is the Holy Spirit to you? Western Church now, with our new translations, has a stronger epiclesis, but something else I'd like to point out to you. Again, how each Eucharistic prayer gives us a sense of the spirit, the theological tenor, the, the, the uh, theology of the different denominations. There is a church in the East that's now in union with Rome that has no words of institution. The Assyrian Church of the East is a very small, persecuted minority in the Middle East, but this church never had the words of institution in its Eucharistic prayer. Now we think that's impossible, or we think, how can it be a valid Eucharist? Well, Cardinal Ratzinger didn't think so, and this church, the Assyrian Church of the East, is in union with Rome. They have a Eucharistic prayer with no words of institution. The Holy Spirit is much more developed in that Eucharistic prayer. The role of God the Father is much more, and Jesus, of course, his saving, uh, the Paschal mystery is there, but not the words of institution. And if you don't believe me, here's a link. There is a fascinating article in America Magazine that uh, mentions this and that uh, indicates uh, presence of a Eucharistic prayer with no words of institution. You can read this for yourself as well. Okay, I hope this uh, is, again, just an appetizer for what we're going to be doing in this course, much more in your reading assignment, and there'll be much more in the modules and subsequent reading assignments as well in this course in terms of the theology of the Mass. So this is really just a warm-up, but I hope this has given you uh, some more insights into Eucharistic Prayer 1 in particular, but also the theology of the Eucharistic Prayer and the importance of the Eucharistic Prayer and how all the different uh, churches, the liturgical churches, a lot of their theology can be examined just by focusing on what's going on in the Eucharistic prayer. Okay, again, reading assignment on your course syllabus and threaded discussion in your study groups. Until next time, thank you for your attention. Goodbye and God bless.